Hello, lovely people. This is the autobiography of Malcolm X, and this is part eight. When we left Malcolm last time, Malcolm Little at this point in his life, um, he had just got his a little job um, replacing somebody who was out sick or something on a railroad, and he was going to the Big Apple, so he was very excited about it. All right. Oh, and there's a bar called Smalls where he had walked in and just kind of felt so enamored with um, just classy Negroes is what he noticed. You know, not flashing their money, not being loud. And the way they dressed, the way they talked, he was really um, impressed by it and influenced. And the place is called Smalls. From Smalls, I taxied over to the Apollo Theater. I remember so well that Jay McShann's band was playing because his vocalist was later a close friend of mine, Walter Brown, the one who used to sing Hootie Tootie Blues. From there, on to the other side of 125th Street at 7th Avenue, I saw the big, tall, gray Teresa Hotel. It was the finest New York City it was the finest in New York City where Negroes could stay then, years before the downtown hotels would accept the black man. The Teresa is now best known as the place where Fidel Castro went during his UN visit and achieved the psychological coup over the US State Department when it confined him to Manhattan, never dreaming that he'd stay uptown in Harlem and make such an impression among Negroes. The Braddock Hotel was just up 126th Street near Apollo's backstage entrance. I knew its bar was famous as a Negro celebrity hangout. I walked in and saw along that jam-packed bar such famous stars as Dizzy Gillespie, Dizzy Gillespie, Billy Eckstein, Billy Holiday, Ella Fitzgerald, and Dinah Washington. As Dinah Washington was leaving with some friends, I overheard someone say that she was on her way to the Savoy Ballroom where Lionel Hampton was appearing that night. She was then Hamp's vocalist. The ballroom made the Roseland in Boston look small and shabby by comparison, and the Lindy hopping there matched the size and elegance of the place. Hampton's hard-driving outfit kept a red-hot pace with its guests, such as Arnett Cobb, Illinois Jacquet, Dexter Gordon, Alvin Hayes, Joe Newman, and George Jenkins. I went a couple of rounds on the floor with girls from the sidelines. Probably a third of the sideline booths were filled with white people, mostly just watching the Negroes dance, but some of them danced together. And as in Boston, a few white women were with the Negroes, the people just kept shouting for Hamps, flying home, and really, and finally he did it. I could believe the story I'd heard in Boston about this number, that once in the, in the Apollo, Hamps flying home had made some reefer smoking Negro in the second balcony believe that he could fly. So he tried and jumped and broke his leg. In a, an event later immoralized in the song when Earl Hines wrote a hit tune called Second Balcony Jump. I had never seen such fever heat dancing. Over a couple of slow numbers, after a couple of slow numbers cooled the place off, they brought out Dinah Washington. When she did her salty papa blues, those people just about tore the Savoy roof off. Poor Dinah's funeral was n held not long ago in Chicago. I read that over 20,000 people had viewed her body, and I should have been there myself. Poor Dinah. We became great friends back in those days. But this night of my first visit was kitchen mechanics night at the Savoy, the traditional Thursday night off for the domestics. I'd stay there twice... I'd say there were twice as many women there as men, not only kitchen workers and maids, but also war wives and defense worker women, lonely and looking. Out in the street when I left the ballroom, I heard a prostitute cursing bitterly that the professionals couldn't do any business because of the amateurs. Up and down along between Lenox and 7th and 8th Avenues, Harlem was like some technicolor colored bazaar. Hundreds of Negro soldiers and sailors gawking and young like me passed by. 
Harlem by now was officially off limits to white servicemen. There had already been some muggings and robberies and several white servicemen had been found murdered. The police were also trying to discourage white civilians from coming uptown, but those who wanted to still did. Every man without a woman on his arm was being worked by the prostitutes. Baby, want to have some fun? The pimps would sidle up close, stage whispering. All kinds of women, Jack. Want a white woman? Want a black woman? And the hustlers were merchandising. Hundred dollar rings, man, diamond, ninety dollar watches, two, I'm sorry, this is in a voice. All kinds of women, Jack. You want a white woman? You want a black one? And the hustlers were merchandising. Hundred dollar ring, man, diamond, ninety dollar watch, two. Look at them. Take them both for twenty five. In another two years, I could have given them all lessons, but that night I was mesmerized. This world was where I belonged. On that night, I had started on my way to becoming a Harlemite. I was going to become one of those most depraved parasitical hustlers among New York's eight million people, four million of whom work and the other four million of whom live off of them. I couldn't quite believe that all I had heard and seen that night as I lugged my shoulder strap sandwich box and the heavy five gallon aluminum coffee pot up and down the aisles of the Yankee Clipper back to Boston. I wish that Ella had been on Ella and I had been on better terms. That's his sister, right? Had been on better terms so I could try to describe to her how I felt. Um, but I did talk to Shorty, urging him to at least go see the Big Apple music world. Sophia listened to me, too. She told me that I'd never be satisfied anywhere but New York. And she was so right. And one night, New York, Harlem, had just about nar narco narcotized, narcotized me. I don't know. I don't use the word, but I'm going to have to. Uh, I can guess what it means, but I have to look it up. That sandwich man I'd replaced had little chance of getting his job back. I went bellowing up and down the train aisles. I sold sandwiches, coffee, candy, cake, ice cream as fast as the railroad's commissionary department could supply them. It didn't take me but a week to learn that all you had to do was give white people a show and they'd buy anything you offer them. It was like popping your shoe shine rag. The dining car waiters and Pullman porters knew it too. And they faked their Uncle Tommy to get better tips. We were in the world of Negroes who are both servants and psychologists, aware that white people are so obsessed with their own importance that they will pay liberally, even dearly, for the impression of being catered and entertained. Every layover night in Harlem, I ran and explored new places. I first got a room at the Harlem YMCA. Hey, so this makes me remember, um, I don't know if you all have been listening since I read Black Boy, but it's, I think it's interesting that he's kind of on the same streets and going to the same places that um, Richard Wright went when he um, when he came to, to Harlem. He went right to the YMCA and found himself a place to stay. So, yeah, that's interesting. Um, 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 where am I? I first got a room at the Harlem YMCA because it was less than a block from Small's Paradise. When I got a cheaper room... Wait, then I got a cheaper room at Mrs. Fisher's rooming house, which was close to the YMCA. Most of the railroad men stayed at Mrs. Fisher's. I combed not only the bright light areas, but Harlem's residential areas from the best to the worst. From Sugar, Sugar Hill, from Sugar Hill up near, near Polo Grounds, where many famous celebrities lived, down to the slum blocks of old rat trap apartment houses, just crawling with everything you could mention that was illegal and immoral. Dirt, garbage cans, overflowing or kicked over, drunks, dope addicts, beggars, sleazy bars, storefront churches with gospel being shouted inside, bargain stores, hawk shops, undertaking parlors, greasy home cooking, restaurants, beauty shops, smoky inside from Negro women's hair getting fried, barber shops advertising conch experts, Cadillacs, secondhand and new, conspicuous among the cars on the street. All of it was Lansing's west side, 
all of it was Lansing's West Side or Roxbury South End magnified a thousand times. Little basement dance halls with for rent signs on them. People offering you little cards advertising rent raising parties. I went to one of these. 30 or 40 Negroes sweating, eating, drinking, dancing, gambling, and jammed in a beat up apartment. The record player going full blast and the fried chicken or chitlins with potato salad and collard greens for a dollar a plate and cans of beer or shots of liquor for 50 cents. Negro and white and white canvassers sidled up alongside you talking fast as they tried to get you to buy a collar, um, a copy of the Daily Worker. This paper's trying to keep your rent controlled. Make that greedy landlord kill them rats in your apartment. This paper represents the only political party that ever ran a black man for the vice president of the United States. Just want you to read it. Won't take but a little bit of your time. Who do you think fought hardest to help free those Scottsboro boys? Things I overheard among Negroes when the salesmen were around let me know that the paper somehow was tied in with the Russians. But to my sterile mind in those early days, it didn't mean much to me. The radio broadcast and the newspapers were then full of our ally Russia, a strong muscular people, peasants with their backs to the wall helping America to fight Hitler and Mussolini. So this is um, another um, connection between Black Boy, the first book I read, um, because remember Richard was going through all the controversy of being called a communist and all of that. And, um, and he was um, helping to write these papers, right? And he was a part of it, so interesting. But New York was heaven to me, and Harlem was seventh heaven. I hung in, um, I hung around in Smalls and the Braddock Bar so much that the bartenders began to pour a shot of bourbon, my favorite brand of it, when they saw me walk in the door. And the steady customers in both places, the hustlers in Smalls and the entertainers in Braddock, began to call me Red, a natural enough nickname in view of my bright red conch. I now had my conch done in Boston at the barber shop of Abbott and, Fo and Fogey. It was the best conch shop on the East Coast, according to the musical greats who had recommended it to me. My friends now included musicians like Duke Ellington's great drummer, Sonny, Sonny Greer, and that, grace person and that great personality with the violin, Ray Nance, He's the one who used to sing in that wild cat style, blip, blip, blippity bop, blamp, bam. And people like Cootie Williams and Eddie Cleanhead Vinson, who kid me about his conk. He had nothing up there on his head but skin. He was hitting the heights when it, with his song, Hey Pretty Mama, Chunk Me Up in Your Big, big Brass Bed. I also knew Sly Oliver, and he was married to a red complexion girl, and they lived up on Sugar Hill. Cy did a lot of arranging for Tommy Dorsey in those days. His most famous tune, I believe, at that time was Yes Indeed. The regular Yankee Clipper sandwich man, when he came back, was put on another train. He complained about seniority, but my sales record made them placate him in some other way. The waiters and cooks had begun to call me Sandwich Red. By that time, they had a laughing bet going that I wasn't going to last long. Sales or not, because I had so rapidly become such an uncouth, wild young Negro. Profanity, profa profanity had become my language. I'd even curse customers, especially servicemen. I couldn't stand them. I remember that once when some passengers complained about me and had gotten... Mm, mm, mm. I remember once when some passenger complaints had gotten me a warning. And I wanted to be careful... I was work, walking down the aisle and a big beefy red faced cracker soldier got up in front of me. So drunk he was weaving and bobbing. He announced loud enough that everybody in the car heard him. I'm going to fight you, nigger. I remember the tension. I laughed and told him, sure, I'll fight, but you've got too many clothes on. And he had on a big army overcoat. He took that off and I kept laughing and said that he still had too many clothes on. I was able to get to keep that cracker stripping off clothes till he stood there drunk with nothing on from his pants up and the whole car was laughing at him. And some other soldiers got him out of the way. I went on. I never would forget that I couldn't have whipped him. 
I couldn't have whipped that white man as badly with a club as I did with my mind. Many of the New Haven line cooks and waiters still in railroad service today will remember old Pappy Cousins. He was the Yankee Clippers steward, a white man, of course, from Maine. Negroes had been in dining car service as much as 30 and 40 years, but in those days, there were no Negro stewards on the New Haven line. Anyway, Pappy Cousins loved whiskey, and he liked everybody, even me. A lot of passenger complaints about me, Pappy let slide. He'd ask some of the old Negroes working with me to try to calm him down some. Man, you, can t you can't tell them nothing, they'd exclaim, and they couldn't. At home in Roxbury, they would see me parading with Sophia, dressed in my wild zoot suit. Then I'd come to work, loud and wild and half high on liquor or reefers, and I'd, s <clears throat> and I'd stay that way, jamming sandwiches at people until we got to New York off the train, and I'd go through that Grand Central Station afternoon, rush hour crowd, and many white people simply stopped in their tracks to watch me pass. The drape and the cut of the zoo suit showed the best advantage, showed the best advantage if you were tall, and I was over six feet. My clunk was fire red, and I was really a clown, but my ignorance made me think I was sharp. My knob-toed shoes, orange in color, kick-up shoes, were nothing but floor sheens. The ghetto Cadillac of shoes in those days. Some shoe companies made these ridiculous styles for sale only in the black ghettos where ignorant Negroes like me would pay big name prices for something that we associated with being rich. Now, do folks uh, still be paying too much for shoes um, to, I don't know, as a status symbol? I'm just wondering. And then between Small's Paradise and the Braddock Hotel and other places, as much as my 20 or $25 would allow, I drank liquor, smoked marijuana, painted the Big Apple red, and increasing numbers of friends, and finally Mrs. Fletcher's rooming house. I got a few hours of sleep before the Yankee Clipper rolled again toward Boston. It was inevitable that I was going to be fired sooner or later. What finally finished me was an angry letter from a passenger. The conductors added their bit, telling me, telling how many verbal complaints they'd had and how many warnings I'd been given. But I didn't care, because in those wartime days, such jobs as this, as this I could aspire to were going begging for people. When the New Haven line paid me off, I decided it would be a nice time to go take a trip to see my brothers and sisters in Lansing. I had accumulated some railroad free travel pass privileges. Thank you, Daphne. Miss you. None of them back in Mich Michigan could believe it was me. Only my oldest brother, Wilfred, wasn't there. He was away at Wilberforce University in Ohio studying a trade. But Philbert and Hilda were working in Lansing. Reginald, the one who had always looked up to me, had gotten big enough to fake his age. And he was planning soon to enter the Merchant Marines. Yvonne, Wesley, and Robert were in school. My conk and whole costume were so wild that I might have been taken as a man from Mars. I caused a, a, a minor automobile collision. One driver stopped to gape at me, and the driver behind him bumped into him. My appearance staggered the older boys I had once envied. I'd stuck out my hand saying, skin me, daddy-o. My stories about the Big Apple, my reefers keeping me sky high wherever I went, was the life of the party. My man, give me some skin, I was saying. The only thing that brought me down to earth was the visit to the state hospital in Kalamazoo. My mother sort of half sensed who I was, and I looked up to Shorty's mo and I looked up Shorty's mother. I knew that it would he would be touched by my doing that. She was an old lady, and she was glad to hear from Shorty through me. I told her that Shorty was doing fine and that one day he was going to be a great leader of his own band. She asked me to tell Shorty that she wished he'd write her and send her something in the mail. And I dropped over to Mason to see Mrs. Swirlin, the woman at the detention home who had kept me for those couple of years. Her mouth flew open when she came to the door. My shark skin gray Cab Calloway zoot suit, the long narrow knob toed shoes, and the four inch brim pearl gray hat over my conked fire red hair. It was about too much for Miss Swirlin. She just managed to pull herself together enough to invite me inside. 
between the way I looked at my between the way I looked at my style of talk now, I made her so nervous and uncomfortable that we were both glad when I left. That night before I left, a dance was given at the Lincoln School Gymnasium. I've since learned that in a strange city, to find Negroes without asking where, you just check to see in the phone book where a Lincoln School is. It's always located in the segregated black ghetto. At least it was in those days. It's funny, here in Seattle, the Lincoln School's located in like um, the Wallingford District. That's not the black ghetto, but... That's an interesting thing to think about if you if you visit cities. We'll have to try that out if you're trying to go to the Black Ghetto. <laughs> I'd left Lansing unable to dance, but now I went around the gymnasium floor flinging little girls over my shoulders and hips, showing my most startling steps. Several times the little band nearly stopped and nearly everybody on the floor watching with their eyes like saucers, me, that night, I even signed autographs, Harlem Red, and I left Lansing shocked and rocked. Back in New York, stone broken without any means of support, I realized that the railroad was all I actually knew about anything about. So I went over to the Seaboard Line's hiring office. The railroads needed men so badly that all I had to do was tell them that I had worked on the New Haven Line, and two days later, I was on the Silver Meteor Line, to St. Petersburg and Miami, ripping pillows and keeping the coaches clean and the white passengers happy. I made about as much as I had with the sandwiches working there. I soon ran afoul of the Florida Cracker, who was the assistant conductor. Back in New York, they told me I had to find another job. But that afternoon, when I walked into Small's Paradise, one of the bartenders, knowing how much I love New York, called me to the side and said, if I were willing to quit that railroad job, I might be able to replace a day's waiter who was about to go to the Army. The owner of the bar was Ed Small. He and his um, brother Charlie were inseparable, and I guess Harlem didn't have two more popular and respected people. They knew I was a railroad man, which, for a waiter, was the best kind of recommendation. Charlie Small was the one that I actually talked with in their office. I was afraid he'd want to wait to ask some of his old-timer railroad friends for their opinion of me. Charlie wouldn't have gone for anybody if he heard that they were as wild as I was, but he decided on the basis of his own impression, having seen me in the place so many times sitting quietly, almost in awe, observing the hustling set. I told him when he asked that I'd never been in trouble with the police, and up until then that was the truth. Charlie told me their rules for employees. No lateness, no laziness, no stealing, no kind of hustling of any customers, especially men in uniform. And I was hired. This was 1942, and I, and I had just turned 17 years old. So his birthday is like May 19th, so he had just turned 17. So it's the summer of 1942. With Smalls practically in the center of everything, waiting tables there was seventh heaven seven times over. Charlie Small had no need to caution me against being late. I was so anxious to be there that I'd arrive er an hour early every day. I relieved the morning waiter. As far as he was concerned, mine was the slowest, most no tips time in the day. And sometimes he'd stick around for most of that hour teaching me things for he didn't want to see me fired. Thanks to him, I learned very quickly dozens of little things that could really support a new waiter with the cooks and the bartenders. Both of these, depending on how they like the waiter, could make his job miserable or pleasant, and I meant to become indispensable. Inside of a week, I had succeeded with both, and the customers who had seen me around the bar recognizing me now as the, with the waiter's jacket were pleased and surprised, and they couldn't have been more friendly to me, and I couldn't have been more salicious. Salicious. Another drink? Right away, sir. Would you like dinner? It's very good. Could I get you a menu, sir? Well, maybe a sandwich? Not only the bartenders and cooks who knew everything about everything, it seemed to me, but even the customers also began to school me in, this, in little conversations by the bar when I wasn't busy. Sometimes a customer would talk to me as he ate. Sometimes I'd have long talks absorbing everything with the real old timers who had been around Harlem since the Negroes first came there. That, in fact, 
was one of my biggest surprises, that Harlem hadn't always been a community of Negroes. It had first been a Dutch settlement, I learned, then began massive waves of poor and half-starved and ragged immigrants from Europe, arriving with everything they owned in the world in bags and sacks on their backs. The Germans came first, the Dutch edged away from them, and Harlem became all German. Then came the Irish, running from potato famine. The Germans ran, looking down their noses at the Irish, who took over Harlem. Next, the Italians, same thing. The Irish ran from them. The Italians had Harlem when the Jews came down from the gangplanks and the Italians left. Today, all the same immigrants' descendants are running as hard as they can to escape the descendants of the Negroes, who helped to unload the immigrant ships. Um... I was staggered when old-timer Harlem Knights told me that while this immigrant musical chairs game had been going on, Negroes had been in New York City since 1683, before any of them came, and had been ghettoed all over the city. They had first been in the Wall Street area when they were, when they were pushed into Greenwich Village. The next shove was up to Pennsylvania Station area, and then the last stop before Harlem was the Black Ghetto that was concentrated around 52nd Street, mm, 52nd Street, which is how 52nd Street got the Swing Street name and reputation that lasted long after the Negroes were gone. Then in 1910, a Negro real estate man somehow got two or three Negro families into one Jewish Harlem apartment house. The Jews flew from that house, then from the block and more, <clears throat> and then they flew from the block. Okay. The Jewish Harlem apartment house. The Jews flew from that house, then from the block, and more Negroes came to fill their apartments. Then the whole blocks of Jews ran, and still more Negroes came uptown until a short until in a short time Harlem was like it is today, virtually all black. Well, not today, but when he was writing this, right? So there you go, a story of migration, or you may call it gentrification. Um it's interesting. So I wonder, I know that black people put the stamp of jazz and blues and music and art on Harlem. And I'm very interested how the Germans and the Irish and the Jewish people, um, what stamp they left on Harlem. Very interesting history lesson, my people. Thank you for joining me. I'll see you. Um, I hope to see you tomorrow for part nine of the autobiography of Malcolm X. Have a good night. Have a good week. And we will all see uh, what happens on Tuesday. Peace.